Hello and welcome back to the workbench. This is where we discuss ceiling fan history, trivia, and technical information. Today we're going to start with some new information on ANG Machinery, which as you guys probably know is one of my very favorite fan companies. I did not think that we were going to have this much new information this quickly, so I'm very excited to bring you this video. So let's start. Ackerman Gould was a machining company founded by Frank Ackerman and Herman Gould in 1959. ANG Machinery was a shell company they had incorporated but were not using. Robert Gould, Herman's son, wanted a decorative fan for his home that served only as a light. He bought an antique Westinghouse at an antique store and made one as a hobby. He loved it. People loved it. You know, he thought about, let's see if we can make these. And uh, that says his, his dad's company said, we'll use this shell company that we're not using. He took his prototype to Fortune Off's department store. The lighting buyer said, can you leave it here? Robert said, I can't. This is my only one. I need to go to the photographer later today and get some pictures of it for promotions and things. The lighting buyer said, can you leave it here until then? Robert left it for a few hours, and when he came back, the store had already sold a dozen of them. Robert told the buyer, I don't even know how to make these yet. The buyer said, you better figure it out fast. He started out selling to them, to local retailers, and lighting stores, and lighting distributors. He avoided discount stores and mass retailers. A&G Machinery was actually the inventor of the vintage and modern schoolhouse globe for ceiling fans. If you think about it, you know, Hunter and a few other companies had giant schoolhouses on their antiques, the hotel originals, and things like that. But then in the vintage era, when Emerson and Hunter both started selling light kits for fans... There was always a round globe. When Casablanca started, it was the five with the small globe in the center. But in the very early 70s, A&G was the first company to reintroduce the schoolhouse globe and with the four-inch fitter that was became the standard for ceiling fans. And what happened was um, Bob Gould found the mold to an original antique schoolhouse globe at an antique shop in West Virginia and decided to use that design on his fan light. The fan light was what the fan with the, uh, that was meant to be decorative more so than useful was called. And you'll may recall those started out selling with the schoolhouse globe. And then later they had the round globe and several other options as well. ANG Machinery was the first company to name fans. So you think about how Casablanca had a lot of their fans named after trains, the Broadway, the Zephyr, the Panama, those were all trains. Burton loved trains. Bob Gould loved cars. And so a lot of A&G models were named after cars, like the Bentley. So, how did A&G become the first company to use import motors, which really kind of started the whole importing ceiling fan business in the U.S.? What happened was, in 1973, Bob Gould decided... It was time to start making fans with a real motor and then besides just decorative fans. So he contacted several U.S. motor manufacturers, everybody he could find. No one would sell to him in small quantities. He wanted to buy 50 motors in a shipment. No one, no one would sell that small of a shipment. So he went to Hong Kong. SMC, Wing Tat, whoever else was big in Hong Kong in 1973 threw them out of their factories. He said, we don't sell in small quantities. The only factory in the U.S. or Hong Kong that would sell him motors in small quantities was this tiny, dirty factory in Hong Kong called Chow Electric Company that only employed 25 people. At the time, Chow made cast iron fans. They were machined on a lathe and cast iron dust would go everywhere. They would use unsealed bearings and the cast iron dust would get in the bearings so the fans would be terribly noisy. The fans wobbled because the motors weren't balanced. If you think about it, just like how blades have to be balanced, the rotor on a fan has to be balanced as well. Most of the factories in Hong Kong didn't know how to do that, especially not a small factory like Chow. So uh, Robert asked for sealed bearings, and he asked about balancing the motors. Chow did not want Robert or his engineers inspecting the factory during the day. Part of the reason was that the employees were piecework, and he thought it would slow production. If you don't know what piecework is, it means they're paid per piece, not per hour. So they let him in at night. Robert developed a dynamic balancing machine for balancing motor casings. He used a, a he used the kind of uh, machine that we use for balancing tires and wheel rotors here in the U.S., and he used it for motors. It was so successful 
that the larger Hong Kong factories started to like, hey, what's that they got over there at Chow? Like, how are their motors running smoother than our motors? Um, so Chow asked Robert to leave him the balancing machine and he would do the balancing himself. You can kind of see where that was going. Robert said, no, it's proprietary. Chow figured it out on his own and expanded his factory from 25 employees to several hundred in a four floor factory. Chow also resisted making four bladed fans. He didn't understand why anybody would want four blades. Over there, everybody made three blade fans and Robert was like, no, we would need four blades for the US. AMG Machinery invented the double claw mount, and I might even have one over here. Yeah, these, because you may recall that the fan lights used the lighting bracket, just like the first Casablancas, but when they started putting cast iron import motors in them, they were too heavy for a lighting bracket, so Bob Gould came up with this. And then it became standard for Moss and a whole lot of other companies that got fans from the Hong Kong factories, even though these were actually originally made here by ANG. So, ANG machinery also contracted for the first imported reversible fan motors. Because you gotta remember, back then, Hunter had the reversible blades. Every so often you'd find a reversible shaded pole. Nobody was doing reversible fans. And uh, what had happened was, actually, I don't have this in my notes, but I've heard the story. Uh, they were installing a bunch of fans in the ANG factory. And uh, one of the people who had installed one of them had wired it wrong, so the fan was running in reverse. And they noticed standing under it, wait a second, this is different. Like, this is circulating the air a different way. You know, it's bringing the, the heat down a different way. Like, this is a thing we could, we could market. And so they went to Chow and said, um, can you make these reversible motors? And again, Chow was like, why, why would you want this? Why would anybody want this? Um, and part of the reason why they hated to do that is because you may recall, in order to have a permanent split capacitor motor that's reversible, both coils have to be similar so that one coil can be the main coil, one coil can be the aux coil, and they can switch. Well, back then, the aux coil in Chow's motors was so small that if you switched it, it would burn up quickly. So you couldn't electrically reverse them without destroying the motor unless they changed how they wound the motors. And of course, Chow didn't want to do that. But of course they did. And again, all of this was part of them becoming, you know, one of the, they went from being a tiny, tiny factory with 25 employees to one of the premier importers of ceiling fans out of Hong Kong. Um, A&G also sold their own commercial fans. I've never seen them. I don't know what they look like. They were not CEC. They did not come from Chow. I'm hoping maybe someday I'll find some literature or some pictures or something like that. I just know they're from a different factory, not from Chow Electric Company. Everything for A&G fans was made in the U.S. except for the motors. The blades were made at a woodworking shop near the A&G factory. The metal parts were made at a nearby foundry. The light kits were made at the A&G factory. A lot of us assumed that these were made by CEC and were part of the imported stuff. These, are, these were made here in the U.S. and assembled here in the U.S. and only the motors for the earlier stuff came from Chow. Now the motors in these actually didn't come from Chow and we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so after they started to become successful in 1975, Emerson offered to buy ANG and they said no. 1976 was when the first ANG fans appeared with Emerson motors and it was simply because they wanted to start making fans of this style and Chow only made spinner motors where the blades would you know, either mount on the top or you'd have to retrofit a spinner motor. They wanted a KPD-5 type motor. Chow said, we don't know how to do that. So Angie went to Emerson and um, they could not get enough motors from Emerson. But this, they, the tables had turned now. Because remember before they went to Emerson and Emerson was, like, Emerson was like, we don't sell in those small quantities. Now by 1976, Emerson is getting orders from Casablanca. They're selling their own fans, you know, and they're like, we don't have the quantities you need. We can't get you that many motors. And I think they actually ordered from Emerson and they would be short and the shipments would be late and delayed and not show up because Emerson couldn't make the motors fast enough by 1976. So that's why you find very few ANG fans with Emerson motors in them. So, and we'll get to, again, we'll get to the motor in this in a little bit, it's in my notes. So there was a ANG fan called the Crown Victoria. It was considered to be their top of the line model. It was copper 
and brass and ornate, and it was primarily sold to restaurants. A&G had an in-house engineer named Alan Suskind. Um, he was Bob Gould's right-hand man. I've tried to find him. I uh, haven't been able to find him yet, but I'm going to try. So let's talk about the motor that's in these uh, that we always assumed was a cast uh, CEC Chow Electric Company K63 copy. It was not made in Hong Kong. It was not made at the Chow Electric Company. It was made in Korea by Shinil Industrial Corp., which is a company that made oscillating fans. It was based on an Emerson K63. And what happened was, again, and so in 76, ANG tried to order from Emerson. They could not get enough motors from Emerson. So Bob Gould went to his engineer, Alan Seskind, and he gave him a K63 and it said, I want you to dissect this, deconstruct it, draw all the diagrams for this. I'm going to take them and I'm going to shop it to different motor factories and see who can make me these. And uh, so rather than take the actual motor around, they drew the engineering diagrams of it. Bob Gould shopped them around and the company that was willing to make him a motor of that quality and that power and that style uh, was Shine Hill out of Korea. And that's who made the green cast K63 type motors. So, all of the original ANG designs came to Robert in dreams. That includes cane blades, because remember they were the first company to do cane blades, and the eye fan pattern. Because I really wanted to know where did this design come from? Because it's the weirdest, coolest fan design. According to Bob Gould, that came to him in a dream. So, let's talk about filigree sidemans, because this one actually doesn't have it, um, but the normal Bentley model and some several other ANG models have a filigree sideband um, that became kind of the common staple for imports. For GE events like the Moss Heirloom, they have that filigree sideband, and we always assumed that was like a CEC thing that everybody else copied. I had a conversation with Tom Frampton once where he said anytime he sees a fan with that sideband, he walks right past it because to him it's cheap import stuff. Not true. That design started in the U.S., actually not even at a and at Ackerman Gould. Because Ackerman Gould made parts for light fixtures, and there were some light fixtures that, uh, that used those type of filigree designs. And they were punched out at power presses at the Ackerman Gould press that at the Ackerman Gould factory, and they were sold to various lighting companies. And so uh, Bob Gould got the idea to add them to his fans to make, they were intended to make them look more deco. And then the import companies ended up copying them, and we're going to talk about how that happened in a little bit. a g Machinery was the first fan company to do a parts breakdown with an explosion view in the manual. Now, if you ever looked at an old fan manual, I know Sears ones were very famous for doing this. I don't know which all companies did it and which ones didn't. We have an ANG manual here. Let's see if I can get it to show up on the camera. So there's the explosion view. And I'll post a picture of this in Fans 50 Newman ceiling fans and in the slideshows. But it's just, again, it shows how the thing com is put together from top to bottom. A lot of fan companies did that. ANG was the first. And uh, it was the reason that they did that was because Ackerman Gould did that for their products. Uh, as you can assume, David Moss and other importers, when they found out where Bob Gould was getting these dynamically balanced motors, these motors that didn't have the same problems as other motors because the rotors were balanced in addition to the blades, uh, when they found out where their motors, would, where ANG was getting their motors, that's why everybody started going to CEC. So, here's the story of how the Moss Heirloom and other imports that look suspiciously like uh, A&G products came to be. It's how this canopy came to get copied by Moss and, uh, you know, it's basically just how a lot of import fans look like A&G copies, um, even though the A&G stuff was made and designed here. So... A&G sold fans to the Hilton Hotel chain for their restaurants. There was a time in the 70s when every Hilton Hotel restaurant had A&G fans in them. Mr. Bob Gould and Mr. Chow were having lunch at the Hong Kong Hilton. Chow looks up and points to the fans and says, I like that design. I'm going to copy that. He did not know it was an A&G design. Because he only supplied the motors, so he didn't know what the motors were going into. He didn't know what the finished product looked like, you know. He, um, he just knew that that was a design that he liked. And he probably found out that it had his motor in it later because he bought one 
from the Hilton Hotel and took it back to his factory and copied it and sold his copy to David Moss, which is how we ended up with the Moss Heirloom, the Moss Olympus, etc. Of course, the Heirloom also has the Casablanca faceplate, so there was some other copying going on there. That lunch is when Bob Gould knew he needed an exit from the fan industry. He's like, okay, this is not gonna, you know, this, this business isn't gonna last forever for me. I can see where the direction this is going. Chow offered Robert Gould a partnership in CEC. Bob de declined because he felt they were somewhat dishonest. As an example, ANG had a contract with Chow that any molds used in casting their motors could not be used for any other company's fans. So what Chow would do, they would make a copy of that mold and then use the copy for competitors' fans. So they're not using the same mold. We're not using your mold for our competitors' fans, but it's an identical mold. Or sometimes what they would do is you would stamp the name of the customer into the castings, and that's why you'd see you know, blade arms that have uh, uh, the name stamped into it or other cast parts that have a name stamped into it of an importer rather than the factory because that now the castings are different. They're not the same. This one's got your name stamped in it. This one's got somebody else's name stamped in it. So I'm not using your castings. But Bob Gould felt that was dishonest. So he didn't want to be a partner in CEC. ANG believed that their only true competition was Casablanca. Bob Gould felt that Burton understood fan design and how to make original looking fans, which is interesting because a lot of Casablanca fans were copies of other things, but there were a lot of original designs by combining things together and there were wholly original designs, which is basically what the A&G stuff was too. And it's interesting because again, you know, that was what the strength was. You can tell Bob Gould was not a, like a, a real like cutthroat businessman because he cared about things like honesty and integrity and stuff like that. And generally people who are super successful in business like David Moss do not. Um, but his love was designing fans. Again, all of his designs came to him in dreams. Um, speaking of which, Bob Gould sold an ANG fan to Elvis Presley personally. So we talked in the last video about ANG having the first remote controlled fan. Uh, Bob Gould had a friend in the electronics business. He asked him to design the, you know, what became the first remote-controlled ceiling fan. And they did, and it was first, and it was very problematic. 1982 was actually the last year of ANG production. I can't remember what I said in the last video um, because I was going by when they were showing up in, in ads and advertising and you know corporate records and things like that. But according to ANG themselves, the last year they actually produced fans was 1982. And then in 1985... They had a second attempt at sealing fans with Fan Factory of New York, and they were just sourcing whole products from Chow. So clearly the relationship with Chow was still good enough that he would still buy fans from him in 1985. Okay, so that's all the updates about ANG. Now let's talk about Nadir. In the late 1970s, a Frenchman named Bob Dijodet showed up at the ANG factory in New York. No appointment, just walked in off the street. He had said, hey, I like what you guys are doing. I want to start my own thing in Canada. How do I do that? He had no money. Bob Gould had a good gut feeling about him. He offered to sell him fans on credit. Bob Dijoudet would buy a few at a time, resell them, you know, and rebuild his credit. When he was ready, Bob Gould taught him how to deal with Hong Kong factories on his own. And that is how Nadair was founded. Later on, there was a falling out in the Dijoudet family, and some other family members took over Nadair and made them into the big company they are today. But that, are, that is the origin story of Nadair. So I hope you've enjoyed all this information. I really have. This has been a great learning experience for me, um, especially to learn some really cool facts about some of my favorite fans. I can't imagine that there's much else to learn, but if there is, I will very happily make another workbench video. In the meantime, I hope you've enjoyed this one. Please like, comment, and subscribe. As always, this video has a sponsor, and that video sponsor is Fanstick. Bye, Fanstick.